In today's day and age, it is becoming increasingly more important for us to recognize the importance of preserving our older and more unique buildings in the Kingston area. Many of us drive down streets every day that are full of history without even noticing their significance. There are so many buildings in Kingston that are full of history that are at risk of getting torn down or that have already been taken down because of neglect to realize their significance to our town's history. As our state's first capital, Kingston is fortunate enough to have such beautiful architecture and we can't let those buildings become just memories. The Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church of 72 Spring Street in the Rondack District of Kingston was completed in July of 1875. However, the congregation itself was started in as early as 1839. The original building they worshipped in was located at the corner of Hunter and Ravine Streets, was constructed of wood, and built by the parishioners themselves. After a devastating fire, however, in 1873, they began construction on the current church. The ministry, of the Lutheran ministry, began here in Rondell in 1839. It's a ministry to German immigrants who were working in the shipping business here. And the church was organized around 1842 and occupied a small building down on the Green Street. Uh, that building was lost to a fire. And this building was built in 1874. And the dedication was in 1875. The church is said to be built in a very common style for the day of Romanesque architecture with its arched ceilings and slight Gothic influence. It was designed by a prominent architect of the day, H. Engelbright, who also designed many well-known churches in New York City. This church, however, was originally designed for a German congregation. Until the uh, 1940s, the vast majority of the members were German immigrants. The worship services were German. A parochial school was started here and it was taught in German, so everything they did here was in German. But they soon discovered that children of immigrants much more quickly become uh, the children of their country and um, had great difficulties um, because the generation of the children wanted English because that's what they were speaking. It was only after the division that other ethnic groups started to come to this church. But still today it's called the German Church. And although mass attendance has decreased over the years, people originally had to purchase pews to be assured a seat at mass. And the church still has that capacity to be filled up. Uh, we can sit just shy of 700 people. The average attendance on Sundays are 50. So you can imagine how empty the building feels, uh, even on a holiday like Easter or Christmas when we may have 200, there's still 500 empty seats. It comes as a surprise to many, however, that the masses are not more filled with all the beautiful features that the church has to offer. The grand organ was installed in 1875 and is completely original with the exception of a few cosmetic restorations. Because of the organ's impeccable condition, the church is a favorite spot for many choir concerts as well. Our organ uh, was built in, also in 1874 for this building and dedicated in 1875. It uh, has just been, the pipes have just been renovated, the bellows. So its voice, if someone from 1875 came here, they would hear the organ just as it sounded then. It has a uh, beautiful, beautiful voice, and the acoustics of the building uh, are, are very, very good. And so uh, choral groups sometimes come here. Uh, people just love the sound. Yes, uh, the stained glass windows were all put in at a single time in 1922. The, uh, the north side of the building, churches have different geography. Wherever the altar is, is the east wall. And so the north wall are all uh, moments in the life of Jesus, from his birth to his ascension. And on the uh, south wall, it's all part of the ministry of Jesus, parables and uh, healing ministries of Jesus. Uh, the Lutheran Church be 
began in Germany uh, under the uh, guidance of uh, Martin Luther, who was an Augustinian um, monk. The Lutheran uh, faith uh, is geared towards uh, liberating people. Uh, the liberation is from uh, rule of tradition and custom and church law uh, that scripture is the primary voice that we, li that we listen to, that uh, the message of Jesus Christ is the message we bring to the world, which is a liberating message, freedom from sin and death and the, the power of, of evil, and that all of that is received by us by grace. Everything we get from God is free, unearned, and undeserved. And since we receive it for free, then what we get from God, we give to other people. Free, unearned, and uh, That's forgiveness, acceptance, whatever kind of physical, emotional, and spiritual support. And that, that's the cornerstone of the Church. Even though Reverend Paul Britton has only been at the Spring Street Parish for about a year and a half, he is very involved in keeping the church in its beautiful condition and very concerned about preservation, not only in his church, but in the entire Kingston area. Uh, I, I think that um, here in the United States, we have a penchant for tearing things down when they get old and putting up new things. And we don't leave anything behind. We don't even leave foundations behind. We tear right down to the dirt and re we rebuild. And Part of that then doesn't give us a sense of connectedness, of belonging to any place. And this city is rich in belonging. And so there are buildings here that go back to the Dutch days before English colonization of New York. And uh, you go to the stockade or uptown and you just walk around a little bit and you see our history in stone. And it's right there. And uh, this church, being here since the 1840s, is half the age of the country. And uh, so to keep it here on this corner, to keep it in good repair, is a reminder of all that history that has, has gone by here. Other communities you go to, and there's none of this. Because of beliefs like those of Reverend Britton, the rich history that Kingston is full of continues to influence those in the area. And hopefully, after learning more about these amazing buildings that we have, even more people will join in to help preserve the beauty our town has to offer. After learning about one of the many historic buildings Kingston has to offer, we as a group have gotten a whole new look of the importance of taking pride in our town and preserving all it has to offer. built as a meal barn in 1830 and at the time was owned by the Gill Estate. Bluestone was a huge export that was being mined in the Kingston area and shipped to the bordering areas. Employees at the meal barn would load the mills with stone and bring them down to the Rondo where the barges were loaded with the stone. In 1956, this building was purchased to store masonry equipment and it was then repurchased by Mandy Benjamin Whitwell. In 1990, a new owner purchased the barn and used the upstairs as a home and then abandoned the house. In 2010, Andrew Light had the opportunity to make the barn his own, and he has now nicknamed it the Light Box. When he's finished the modeling and preserving the house, he will then live in the loft above and give local artists a chance to store and show off their artwork at the bottom of his new home. Andrew Light is remodeling the house all by himself with the help of other local services. When he moved into the meal barn, there were vines growing in the house and weeds in the backyard are very hot. Also, the upper loft area was full of pigeon excrement. Andrew hopes to have the house done in a few months and he will get his artwork from a storage center in Canada and show off his work with many other local artists. Andrew said that he wants to keep the historical pieces of the building intact and paint the walls white to help the house stand out and let the true beauty shine for him.
One of Kingston's historic landmarks, City Hall, was nearly demolished in the 1970s due to neglect, but was saved by the citizens and help of friends of historic Kingston. In this video, we talk about this building's miraculous renovation. Right. <laughs> All right, I'm uh, Edwin Ford, and I'm the uh, Kingston City historian, which I have been for uh, 28 years now. And we're going to talk about the uh, City Hall. And uh, uh, it's a beautiful building, as you see. It's all been restored, which I guess was around uh, 2000. But it didn't always look like this. And in fact, it uh, went to rack and ruin probably uh, from 1972 until uh, about the year 2000. But, it, but I'll start back from the very beginning, I think. There were, uh, early on, as you know, there were two villages here. Wilbur, Rondout, and Kingston were three separate villages, and, and they, they wanted to incorporate it into a city, and so they put City Hall here, which is roughly halfway between uh, Rondout and Wilbur, and Kingston was uptown, you know, where the stockade is, you know, the, the uptown Kingston. So this was put in the middle as a show of good faith that they were joining these different parts of the city together, for different villages together to make one city. And that went on for a, a number of years, and. Uh, they had a fire here in uh, 1927, and it uh, started up here in the top part of the city hall with a carpenter shop up in here at some time, and somehow it uh, started the fire. And it burned the whole top of the city hall. All of this uh, was destroyed. After the fire in City Hall, the building was neglected and exposed to harsh environment, leaving the building in ruins. Unable to pay for damage repairs, City Hall became vacant from 1971 to 1998. They didn't care about the building anymore. No. They just they didn't even close up the windows. The windows were broken, and uh, so it, it, there's a, a nice phrase I like called "demolition by neglect." And basically, the building was falling down on itself because nobody was maintaining it. The roof had holes in it. The windows were open. You know, it was open to the weather. Right. And uh, so the, the pitch. <laughs> uh, but but that's that's it was going to be demolished because it was just falling down around itself because we hadn't been maintaining it. And even for a couple of years, when they knew that they were building the other building, they stopped doing any maintenance on it because they figured, why spend any more money here when we're going to have that nice brand new building? Right. The Common Council of Kingston moved to a new site in Roundout, and soon enough there was talk of this historic building's demolition. It was the era of protest in the, uh, in the seventh tail end of the 60s. And so we came over and, and said we didn't want the building torn down. And so then it just sat here, and they didn't want to tear it down. And then when uh, Mayor T.R. Gallo uh, came in in the mid-90s, and he wanted to save the building. and before he was able to get some grant money and then the city put up some money too, it ended up being, I think, about $7 million for the renovation of the building. Oh, gosh. Uh, but there were other proposals before they said, listen, right. forget about doctor's offices, let's make it City Hall. And so, with the help and funding from Friends of Historic Kingston, City Hall was restored in the year 2000. Today, this beautiful building still stands as a historic symbol for the joining of two new towns, Kingston and Rondell. Like ships in the night, you keep passing me by. I'm just wasting time, trying to prove who's right. And if it all goes crashing to the sea, if it's just uh, down where the yeah. chicken wing place was, yeah. and that was torn down. And people thought that that was the worst thing that could happen. You know, here's this grand old building, uh, you know, classical looking, and, and that's how we treat our, our past. You know, we just tear it down, and people were outraged by that. Before 1825, lots of the produce raised by farmers living in Kingston were hauled down to the Roundout Creek. It was Abraham Hasbrook that stored the goods and weekly he traveled down to the New York City. 
It was later decided in 1825 to build a new canal because coal was discovered in Pennsylvania and developers needed to get the coal to other homes and businesses through New York State. Abraham Hasbrook refused to sell any property to the canal company, but he was a merchant and used the canals to transport his goods. The Chestnut Street Historic District was one of the wealthiest districts during the 19th century. Jansen, the son of Abraham I'm Hayes Clement. I live at 48 West Chestnut Street. The house was built in the late 1880s, and it was designed uh, apparently by Calvert Fox, who was one of the more well-known uh, Hudson Valley architects of that era. And the co-designer was Frederick Law Olmsted of Central Park in New York City. So historically, it's significant because of that, and architecturally. You know, to me, it's been my home for seven years, so it means a lot to me personally. When I bought the house, um, a doctor, a local doctor had lived here for about 56 years with his wife and three children. Um, so I did a fair amount of work in restoring it, and sort of restoring some of the original characteristics of my house. This house originally had only one, one and a half bathrooms. Um, we're now on the third floor, which was servants' quarters, and I took one of the bedrooms, there are four bedrooms up here, and I took one of them and turned it into a second full bath. Um, one of the funny things that happens in construction, uh, I had missed coming up here for a couple of weeks, and my contractor was busy at work. He unfortunately misread some plans for the shower. And by the time I saw it again, he had already built it out. And it's uh, roughly two and a half times bigger than it was mm -hmm. supposed to be on the on the architectural plan. But he made a pretty good deal with me that if I didn't make him sort of correct the whole thing and rip it out, that he would pay for the additional tile and things like that. So it's a sort of a colossally big shower that lots of people joke about, but uh, it was a mistake, mm -hmm. but one I've sort of learned to live with. I, I didn't add anything to the house. Um, a lot of it was just heavy cosmetics, painting, uh, redoing floors. Eventually I had to strip all of the exterior paint and in doing that we actually found the original paint that Calvert Vox, the color scheme he probably designed in you know, the late 1880s, so that was a really interesting thing. So most of the work I would characterize as um, Restoration and, and heavy cosmetic work. Rather it be in a different neighborhood. Or... Oh no no no! I, I, this house, Common Fox, uh, married you know one of the McEntee daughters, and is buried at Mount Repos Cemetery, which is at the end of this street. So he designed. There's three houses still standing in Kingston that were designed by him. Two of them are on the street, and the McEntees live on the street. So I think it's entirely appropriate that the house is on, on West Chestnut Street. I think my favorite part of the whole house is the back porch, uh, which is, runs the entire length of the house and is about 25 feet deep. Um, when I saw that, I looked at the house originally. It was a Saturday day. It was a Saturday morning in, I think, October. In the fall, the leaves were out. And I really had a good feeling about the house, but when I saw the porch, it was just sort of a done deal because the view is so magnificent. I've always been interested in it, and I've, I've, I've been a board member around the Friends of Historic Kingston for a long time. Um, I think it's a couple things. I think one of the really unique and, and great things about Kingston is sort of the architectural heritage we have here. Not just Calvert Vox, but a lot of significant architects who worked in Kingston in the, in the early 20th, late 19th century. And also, um, just the breadth of architectural vernaculars that are represented in Kingston. Um, people don't realize this, but there's a significant example of just about every major American architectural style from the late from the late 17th century onward in the city of Kingston. Mm -hmm. Many of which are on one street in Kingston, Fair Street. You can go from a stone house built in, 1700, in the early 1700s all the way up to sort of mid-century modern houses built, you know, in the 1960s. It's pretty spectacular. In every single major architectural vernacular is, is represented on that one street. So one of the things that separates Kingston from a lot of other cities in New York State, to me, is just the wealth of the housing stock we have here and the sort of architectural legacy. Mm -hmm. 
the, again, the, the family that owned this uh, house before me for 50-something years was a family of five, husband, wife, and three kids. And they never used, they never even used this uh, third floor. It stayed pretty much empty. They used it for storage. They used to wrap Christmas presents in here and store Christmas dust. But this was never really, this was never even used as bedrooms until I bought the house. It hasn't changed hands that much. It was the family I bought it from lived here 56 years, and then the Rylands family, uh, parts of the Rylands family, they lived here for probably 15 years. Uh, so I, I know a number of the people who've lived here in the past, at least since the early 1900s. Wow. Known as a gem to Uptown Kingsville, many people pass by this beautiful yellow building every day. It would have been one of many gas stations in Kingston if not saved by Fred J. Johnston. The house was built in 1812 by John Sudam, who was a state senator. Around 1812, he decided that he wanted a fashionable residence here in uptown Kingston. So he built the beautiful house that still stands on the corner. He happened to be a close personal friend of Washington Irving perhaps one of the most famous authors in American literature, the author of Rip Van Winkle and uh, many other tales that we all know so well. He was also a very close friend of Martin Van Buren, who became the eighth president of the United States. Both of those men actually came to the house as guests of Mr. Sudam and stayed overnight. So that is perhaps the most historic event that took place in the house. When John Sudam died in 1835, the house remained in the Sudam family until 1888, when it was sold to the Van Leuven family. And it remained in that family until 1938, when they decided to perhaps sell the property for commercial purposes. There was uh, the possibility that a gas station was going to be put on the site, and that's when Mr. Johnston decided to buy the house to preserve it. And it's one of Kingston's greatest preservation stories, and Mr. Johnston is one of Kingston's greatest preservationists. A federal style house with palladian style windows, two stories high, and a great design. Fred J. Johnston, an antiquarian and preservationist, saved the house in 1938. Johnston's dream as a teenager was to become an antique dealer. For his antiques, he used the family garage. In 1936, a reservation architect named Myron Teller introduced Johnston to leading collectors. This launched Johnston's career as an antique dealer on a national scale. This led him to find storage for his antiques. Miss Patricia Murphy, a member of the board of directors for Friends of Historic Kingston, knows all about it. In 1993, when Fred J. Johnston died, he bequeathed the house to the Friends of Historic Kingston with the mandate that we always maintain the house as a museum. And that's what we have been doing since his death. In 1997, we opened the house as a museum, and we have left all eight rooms exactly the way he designed them before he died. When Mr. Johnston bought the house, he decided that he would use it as both his home and a showroom. He was a, an antique dealer, and bought what better way to uh, show customers how nice a sofa could look in a parlor than to let people walk through rooms that looked comfortable and beautiful. So that's what he did. He had a real flair for decorating. He had a real artist eye and an artist eye for color. And so he designed each room with a um, color scheme. And if you stand in the doorway and look at the eight rooms of the house, your eye can follow 
certain color schemes throughout uh, the room. But that's why he did it, so that uh, his clients could see how they could live very comfortably with antiques, that antiques did not have to be stiff and hard and overly formal. Uh, so we have left the rooms exactly the way Mr. Johnston designed them. When we opened the Friends of the Fred J. Johnston House in 1997 as a museum, it opened exactly the way it was when he died. The rooms looked as if Mr. Johnston just walked out for a few minutes. And we will never change them because he did such beautiful arrangements. We've left every candlestick in place, every lamp, every vase, so that you get a very good idea of what it was like when um, Mr. Johnston allowed clients uh, to come here and take them through the house. It was a great shopping experience. Think about it. To go through somebody's private home and say, I think I would like that chair, and, and you could buy the chair. So it was a unique way to uh, market his merchandise. Friends of Historic Kingston is a volunteer organization whose members value the city's historic fabrics as an asset that enhanced the quality of the life of the residents in the community of Kingston. All over, not just in Kingston, across the river. I look, you know, down in New Paltz. This location always came up as being, you know, a really good spot. Uh, we have been here since 2000, so this is our 12th year. On a day-to-day -day operation, we get a lot of people from um, surrounding businesses or the hospital, the school itself. The building itself was attractive on the outside, but the inside was all covered up. Uh, when I first saw this, this was a just a plain rectangular space. Uh, these windows were invisible. This was, it was a false wall here, and it was a, a acoustical tile ceiling uh, that came four feet lower than that ceiling. Uh, there were fluorescent lights. Uh, there was nothing in here to give away that any of this was underneath. We spent weeks and weeks cleaning this floor up to get to the original tile. Uh, the wainscot was the original wainscot all the way around. Uh, so pretty much the floor, the ceiling, and the wainscot is all original from 1906. We ran the chimney through the existing flue that was in the building so that we would not do anything to the outward appearance of the building that would change it. Uh, another example of working around the building. And we basically followed the same pattern. We snaked all the electric through and made it look pretty much like what it probably was originally. And then we also uncovered a fireplace, which nobody knew was here, uh, which was probably the original gas heater for the space.
You know, you probably see a lot of chain businesses that you go in where they try to recreate an old uh, appearance or atmosphere. Uh, a lot of chain restaurants do that. Well, this isn't a recreation. This is it. This is what it was. This is what Kingston looked like 100 plus years ago. You know, and if you modernized it, you wouldn't be able to do that. Um, I guess the lesson from it is that for other businesses, if you have something uh, like this that you can capitalize, it can only make your business that much better. Uh, you can benefit from it rather than just destroying it and covering it up. George Rippenberg owned the Manhattan restaurant, I believe. I've seen some artifacts from their original opening. So I'm assuming that they called this the Manhattan restaurant because the people used to get off of work and come over here to eat afterwards because it was an oyster house. They specialized in oysters and clams. I never really knew for about five years it took me about that long to figure out where the name came from. It was called the Fulton House, Fulton's, or a whole bunch of things, and they were little advertisements for taking home a box of clams. Or Two drug stores in here. Central Pharmacy was here. Uh, Walker and Maven. The Maven will walk around the gym first. The last business that was here prior to us was the Kingston Cycle and the Bicycle Shop, which is now in the town of Austin.
it's kind of like uh, not knowing who your ancestors are. that when we found that there was so much history here and it was still here, we had to restore it. We really need to feel connected to the past because I think when we do that, we also recognize how important the future is to preserve things so people in the future have the same connection to us uh, when we're not here anymore. We focus on a particular region or uh, type of coffee and roast that to the level where we think it tastes the best and uh, offer that up for people to, uh, to select from. Uh, a lot of places, you know, it, it's good, but because we really do small batches at a time and concentrate on, on each roast, uh, it becomes uh, really kind of a stellar thing and really particular tastes. R&F Handmade Paints is located on Tenbrook Avenue in Kingston. It serves as a paint factory, studio, and workshop. Standard Oil had this building from the, uh, from the 1890s until about 1920. They renovated an old industrial uh, building, so now it's resurrected and it's beautiful and it's really fun to walk in the front door and you see artwork everywhere, there are announcements everywhere, you feel like you're in a hub of a activity. The building was originally owned by J.D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company and used as a factory to refine oil. It's a very open space and it's great to just move around. It's a very flexible place. It's full of thousands of things that you can use, tools, material, and space. Uh, you know, the, you always have a lot of problems, and we had a great relationship with our contractor, with our main contractor, uh, actually with all of them. We had to have a lot of different contractors, as you know, as you can imagine. We we had somebody who did the, um, uh, the uh, who did the demolition, took took down all the old walls and put in the new walls, and and did the painting and and and, and did the window trim at, outside. And stuff like that. He was, uh, he was. They were great to work with, but you were always having to make decisions all the time. What tiles on the floor? What, what? Uh, uh, do we tear out the drop ceiling? Um, uh, and then we had a roofer who was a really good roofer who, but a, uh, you know, who was able to put uh, thicker frame. In fact, I meant to show this. Uh, this is probably the original clear story. Um, and uh, we just, um, when we, instead of repainting it, we scraped down the paint to show the original paint and then shellacked it so that we showed the history of, of the building. The RNF building is a natural beauty and it was very important to Richard, the new owner, to preserve that building. Because we make paints that are very traditional, and we're working with artists, uh, the fact that we're in a very old building and a renovated brick building, which is something artists always love because of the space it gives, 
um, it's perfect for us. If you haven't yet, you should check it out. So the person who built the bakery uh, was James Van Buren. He built the bakery in 1883. It's, it's a late 19th century Italianate um, and opened a business here. He was a, uh, uh, a dealer in leather goods and fi findings. His sign is still on the side of the building if you go outside and look. by. 1907, the Rear family bought it and turned it into a bakery. Frank Rear was the immigrant. He came from Prussia in the 1880s, and at that time, uh, life was very hard for Jews in Eastern Europe. They often fled because of uh, poverty and because they had to go into the army. Frank Rear had three children to a previous wife who died in 1888. Then he married Ada Odeshevsky in 1903. And they had four daughters and two sons. The older son, Willie, became the first of the bakers to take over after Frank died in 1936. And he was fo followed by uh, Jaime, who was the baker that I met in, in 2004. Um, and they baked and de delivered. The four sisters one of them baked from time to time, helped down in the bakery. One of them kept the storefront, another one kept the books, and another one was responsible for keeping the upstairs here clean and uh, cooking for all of them. The Rondout area used to be the center of business for Kingston. It was a major enterprise, and the things that came on here were major enterprises. That all changed by the beginning of the 20th century. But it, contained, it continued to be a commercial center, because it was also a transportation hub. This was a shopping center for uh, most of Ulster County. People would come down, down here. Uh, that started to change in the 1920s and 30s when uh, bridges were built over the Hudson. And uh, more and more traffic was di diverted around Kingston. With By the 50s, you had the throughway. And, um, IBM then settling in town of Ulster, north of here. Um, this became, so the transportation re revolution that was fueled by the uh, automobile was its undoing. This is a picture of the bakery and the surrounding Rondout Valley. Here's a close-up of the bakery. Here's another picture of the bakery. Here's the bakery today. Here's a picture of the Rondout Valley now. As you can see, trees have replaced all of the buildings. Here's a quick comparison. This is the main room and the entrance. So this is the, uh, the retail space. Uh, this is... Um, they mostly served breads and uh, they mostly sold breads and rolls. They didn't sell cakes. They had some gro grocery items, but it was always sparse. Um, basically, uh, one of the sisters ran this part of the operation. This is a dough rising table. They worked on this surface, and then they would put the dough in there for the sourdough. Uh, from what I under uh, understand. This is the um, coal oven uh, that, as far as I know, goes back to approximately 1916. This is a dough mixer. This was the main living quarters for the family. Um, for most of the time, this was they basically all lived in here. This is a bedroom. Uh, 
there were two two beds in here. This was blocking off the door, and they did talk about throwing stuff back and forth to one another, as kids will do. As you can see here, this is the main bedroom. It had about two to three beds in it. This is another bedroom. It had about two beds in it. The thing we noticed the most was just how small the rooms were. It's sort of hard to believe that four girls and two boys all lived here together. But as Mr. Miller pointed out, we've gotten so used to having big rooms today, it's hard to imagine living in small rooms. This apartment, I'm thinking, would make... Uh, uh, I would like to see re refit as it would have looked as a living space. The restoration of the bakery is going well, and with contributions from the community, it can be restored to the great building it once was.